We had 51 former Intel officials falsely, falsely tell us the Biden laptop was Russian disinformation. We had a raid on President Trump's home. And of course, we got Alvin Bragg's ridiculous case in New York. Seven years, nothing has changed. Don't believe me? We interviewed Stephen D'Antuano, former head of the Washington field office when the Trump classified document case began. Mr. D'Antuano told the committee, we interviewed him just two weeks ago, two weeks ago today. Mr. D'Antuano told the committee that when he asked the Department of Justice, why is there new, no US attorney assigned to the Trump classified document case? Headquarters said, because we're running it. He suggested the Miami field office should do the raid. Instead of sending the folks from Washington field office down to Miami, how the folks in, in the Miami field office do it? Headquarters said no. He suggested there shouldn't be a raid. Instead, they should continue to work with President Trump's lawyers. Once again, headquarters said no. Mr. D'Antuano even said, how about when we get there? When we arrive at President Trump's home, we then call his lawyer and we do the search together. Again, headquarters said no. Another interesting fact, the lawyer who turned down Mr. D'Antuano's request happens to be the same person who is alleged to have pressured the attorney representing a Trump employee about a judgeship. Nothing has changed, and frankly, they're never going to stop. Seven years of attacking Trump is scary enough, but what's more frightening, any one of us could be next. In fact, it's already started. Parents at school board meetings are terrorists. Pro-life Catholics are extremists. Even journalists aren't safe. Federal Trade Commission, 13 letters. One of those letters to Twitter said, who are the journalists you're talking to? Think about that. They named four people personally to come and testify in front of this committee. While they're in front of this committee, Democrats are asking them to reveal their sources, violate First Amendment principles. One of them, Matt Taibbi, while he's sitting at that table testifying to the Judiciary Committee, the IRS is knocking on his door. Parents, Catholics, journalists, but guess who gets it the worst? Guess who gets it the worst? Whistleblowers. If you dare come forward and tell Congress what's going on, look out. They will come for you. They will take your clearance. They will take your pay. They'll even take your kids' clothes. Just ask Garrett O'Boyle, who testified in front of this committee as well. Over the next few hours, we're going to hear the facts and details about the whole false Trump-Russia narrative, the crossfire hurricane investigation, and hopefully, hopefully it will help change things at the Department of Justice. But regardless of what the Biden administration and the Garland Justice Department do, I know what Republicans in the House are committed to doing. We will work to dramatically change the FISA law, and we will do everything we can in the appropriations process to stop the federal government from going after the American people. Now recognize the ranking member for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On June 8th, a grand jury in Miami indicted former President Trump on 37 counts related to his mishandling of extraordinarily sensitive national security information, including information regarding defense and weapons capabilities of both the United States and foreign countries, United States nuclear programs, potential vulnerabilities of the United States and its allies to military attack, and plans for possible retaliation in response to a foreign attack. According to the indictment, the unauthorized disclosure of these classified documents could put at risk the national security of the United States, foreign relations, the safety of the, of the United States military, and human sources, and the continued viability of sensitive intelligence collection methods. And indeed, the indictment goes on to describe how the former president made such unauthorized disclosures. Even if you believe, as Chairman Jordan claims, that President Trump has committed no crime, Surely we can agree that it is dangerous and profoundly irresponsible to have taken these documents from the White House and left them unsecured in Mar-a-Lago. Don't take, take just my word for it. Trump's Secretary of Defense, Mark Esper, said that the former president's handling of this information put U.S. service members' lives and our national security at risk. And Trump's hand-picked Attorney General, Bill Barr, with whom I agree on very little, 
hit the nail on the head when he described the former president's legal troubles as, quote, entirely of his own making. He had no right to these documents. The government tried for over a year, quietly and with respect, to get them back, and he jerked them around. When he faced a subpoena, he didn't raise any legal arguments. He engaged in a course of deceitful conduct. That was a clear crime if those allegations are true, close quote. The former president could have at any time for months simply returned the documents and avoided prosecution. But House Republicans do not want to talk about any of that. They seem incapable of assigning any agency or responsibility to Donald Trump for problems that are Trump's and Trump's alone. Instead, Republicans have planned this hearing and constructed an entire false narrative around this work of special counsel Durham in an effort to distract from the former president's legal troubles and mislead the American public. To be clear, the Durham report is by itself a deeply flawed vessel. After four years, thousands of employee hours, and more than six and a half million dollars in taxpayer dollars, special Dur counsel Durham failed to uncover any wrongdoing that Justice Department Inspector General Horowitz had not already found in 2019. He brought just two cases to trial and lost them both. Both defendants were acquitted in mere hours. The single conviction that Special Counsel Durham obtained involved a single charge of lying to the FBI, a case developed and handed to him by the Inspector General, and one resolved by a quick plea bargain. The report itself outlined some fairly glaring investigative missteps. The FBI apparently never even looked at a thumb drive of key evidence related to allegations of contact between the Trump campaign and the Russian government via a Russian cell phone. Nor, says the report, did the FBI ever examine questionable computer contacts between the Trump Organization and Alpha Bank, one of the largest banks in Russia. The report also fails to recommend a single remedial measure that the Justice Department or the FBI might take to address certain process-related concerns, largely because DOJ and FBI have already implemented the changes recommended by the Inspector General three and a half years ago. Now, I understand that, like the former president, many MAGA Republicans had a lot riding on the Durham investigation. I understand that they may, might be disappointed with where it landed, but that is no excuse for making things up. First, the Durham report unequivocally concludes that the FBI not only had the evidence to open an investigation into Russian interference in the 2016 election, but actually had an affirmative obligation to investigate ties between the Russian government and the Trump campaign. It is simply not true, as some Republicans have claimed, that the Durham report suggests that there should not have been an investigation. Affirmative obligation. Those are Mr. Durham's words, not mine. Second. The Durham report shows that the FBI began its investigation when an aide to the Trump campaign disclosed in May 2016 that the campaign knew that Russia had thousands of emails that would embarrass Hillary Clinton. The aide bragged about it at a bar. An Australian diplomat who overheard the remark reported it, and the investigation began. It is simply not true, as the most extreme voices in this room have claimed, that the investigation was somehow launched by the Clinton campaign. That con particular conspiracy theory is off by several months. Nor is it true that the FBI was opposed to Trump from the beginning. For example, the Durham report tells us that the FBI encouraged a confidential human source to infiltrate the Clinton campaign, not the Trump campaign, and take steps to entrap, unsuccessfully, aides to Secretary Clinton. This story is right there on pages 74 and 75 of the report. I suspect we won't hear a word about it from House Republicans today because it does not fit the MAGA narrative. Finally, nothing in the Durham report disputes the central findings of Special Counsel Robert Mueller. Namely, Russia interfered in the 2016 election. It did so to help Donald Trump, and the Trump campaign welcomed this interference. This last point is important because it tells us how Mr. Durham became Special Counsel in the first place and it goes to the heart of the fully false narrative of MAGA victimhood. From the day that Special Counsel Mueller began his work, Donald Trump and his political allies have railed against an imagined conspiracy against the former president. 
The Russian investigation was a setup. It was a witch hunt. Obama did it. We need to investigate the investigators. Then came the Mueller report. The Mueller report was delivered to Attorney General Barr on Friday, March 22nd, 2019. The next Monday, Mr. Durham was in Barr's office. A week later, a colleague emailed Mr. Durham to ask about, quote, the project that Durham and Barr were working on. While we on this committee were fighting to get access to the Mueller report, Mr. Durham was already working on an investigation to undercut its central findings. A few weeks later, the Trump administration announced Mr. Durham's investigation into the investigators. And by August 2019, Mr. Durham and Attorney General Barr were on a plane to Europe, jointly hunting down non-existent evidence of Donald Trump's deep state conspiracy theories. If the duo ever found evidence proving that Donald Trump was right all along, that evidence certainly never made it into the Durham report. It has been alleged, however, that they found evidence implicating the former president in certain financial crimes during their trip. Incidentally, that information, too, is missing from Mr. Durham's final pages. When he could not give Donald Trump evidence of a deep state conspiracy, Mr. Durham gave him the next best thing, a public narrative with Hillary Clinton as the victim, villain. Over the ensuing years, Mr. Durham constructed a flimsy story built on shaky inferences and dog whistles to far-right conspiracy theorists. Although he lost both times, he took a case to trial. By prolonging his investigation, Durham was able to keep Donald Trump's talking points in the news long after Trump left office. With a loose approach to DOJ norms, protecting the reputation of the agency, and a cavalier disregard for the privacy and reputational rights of others, Mr. Durham's investigation operated as headline generator for MAGA Republicans. Less than half a year into his four-year investigation, Mr. Durham publicly disputed Inspector General Horowitz's conclusion that the FBI was warranted in opening a full investigation in violation of DOJ rules protecting investigations from appearances of political bias. Mr. Durham similarly flouted guidelines designed to protect third parties from reputational injury when he used his two indictments to accuse the Clinton campaign of a vast conspiracy to tie Trump to Russia. But at the end of the day, Mr. Durham never found what he was looking for. He cannot dispute a single conclusion in the Mueller report. He cannot prove a magnificent deep state conspiracy. And he cannot say that the FBI investigation into the Trump campaign's many ties to Russia never should have happened. And again, I can see why this would be disappointing to some. But instead of owning up to his failure, the Durham report doubles down on theories that lost spectacularly before two unanimous juries. The report also references classified material that has been called likely disinformation to lay out a series of accusations against the former president's perceived enemies. By presenting his so-called findings in this way, swiping a Republican boogeyman and hiding an inconvenient truce in footnotes, the Durham report gives Donald Trump one last talking point. It did not have to be this way. It may be hard to remember, but at the outset of the Durham investigation, Mr. Durham was a well-respected career prosecutor with a solid reputation. The Attorney General is supposed to appoint the special counsel to prevent the appearance of politicization in a criminal investigation. Mr. Durham could well have lived up to that expectation. Instead, what we got was a political exercise that operated with ethical ambiguity and existed to perpetuate Donald Trump's unfounded claims. The investigation failed in its political objectives, but did real damage to a department that is still recovering from the excesses of the Trump administration. And despite Mr. Durham's best efforts, a reckoning is well underway. Do not be misled. Former President Donald Trump is not a victim. He did this to himself. For all of its flaws, the Durham report does not show that anyone else is responsible for the president's legal woes, past, present, or future. Anyone who tells you otherwise is simply making it up. I thank the chairman, and I yield back.